Let me uh, present our analyst here, Michael Dempsey. So just a little background on him. Um, obviously, he's a research analyst here at CB Insights, and he produces a lot of our data-driven analysis and reports on private company financings, exits, performance trends across emerging industries, geographies, and investors. Outside of e-commerce, he focuses a lot on drones, space startups, AR, VR, food tech, and sort of the global and international landscape of the private markets. Prior to joining us here at CB Insights, Mike was an investment analyst at Crane Partners, which is a multi-strategy hedge fund where he invested across multiple asset classes, including private equity, seed stage, venture capital, and equity derivatives. If you haven't seen Mike's research on CB Insights, it's quite possible you've seen him in some of his feature reports in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, Bloomberg, CNBC, and the LA Times. Mike's a graduate of NYU, so if any of you are local here and uh, had the pleasure of joining him there, um, let us know. So with that, I'm going to end my spiel and hand over the mic to... Thanks, Victor. So today we're going to talk about the changing landscape of global e-commerce, uh, who the new winners are, the mounting brick-and-mortar casualties, and uh, some of the emerging financing trends. Uh, first, a little bit about CB Insights. We're backed by the National Science Foundation, and we use data science and machine learning to help our customers predict what's next, whether that's their next customer, their next investment, next market they should attack, the next move of their competitor, or the next company they should acquire. We're used by some of the world's leading corporations, including Cisco, Castrol, Salesforce, and a few of the others seen here. Our mantra is, in God we trust, all others must bring data. Uh, in venture capital and the private markets, there's a lot of punditry, and we try and put data uh, at the forefront of all of our analyses, so that's where the mantra comes from. In the next 30 to 45 minutes, we're going to cover the changing commerce landscape and how infrastructure is moving online, uh, the booming physical goods e-commerce funding environment, momentum within e-commerce, some of the hot companies, uh, a case study on Nordstrom, and where e-commerce is headed next. First, what is physical goods e-commerce? The way we're defining that today is any startup or company focused on the sale or facilitation of a sale of a physical good. This includes apparel companies, food delivery companies, electronics, multi-product marketplaces, and more. We're not including startups selling services such as many of the on-demand companies like Uber and Lyft. So with that, we'll get started. Uh, first, we're going to look at how physical goods commerce market is changing. So our incumbents being really being hurt by e-commerce. Mark Andreessen was quoted as saying, quote, retail guys are going to go out of business and e-commerce will become the place everyone buys. You're not going to have a choice. We're still pre-death of retail and we're already seeing a huge wave of growth. The best in class are going to get better and better. We view this as a long-term opportunity. And the short answer of this is yes, they are being hurt. This is the expected number of U.S. retail store closings and downsizing for a bunch of major brands, from Radio Shack, who is going bankrupt, to Office Depot, and then even to McDonald's, who is facing its own issues as uh, consumers change their uh, eating behaviors. Some of the major players within these spaces have underperformed across many different verticals, whether that's Best Buy, Staples, JCPenney, or Sears, all have significantly lagged the S&P in returns over the last five years with only Best Buy with a recent pop being positive in returns. However, others have weathered the storm and or benefited from some economic shifts. Some of the more multi-product discount retailers, such as Walmart and Target and TJX, which operates TJ Maxx and Marshalls and other discount stores, all have seen relatively good growth with TJX significantly outperforming the S&P over time. And some of the incumbent e-commerce giants have also seen astronomic growth. Specifically, we looked at Amazon, which has seen a 272% stock increase over the past five years, as well as eBay, which up until their recent spinoff of PayPal was up over 150%. So how does this translate to private markets? Global physical goods e-commerce activity went from 300 million in Q110 to 4.9 billion in Q215. Year-over-year funding to these private VC-backed companies 
grew 238% from $4.7 billion in 2013 to over $11 billion in 2014. So clearly there is investment activity growing. And the funding has been really dominated by three countries, um, specifically the United States, India, and China. Um, Asia, you know, it generally has, has led in a lot of the uh, total funding received with China specifically outpacing the U.S. with 28% of the uh, total funding since 2010. But if you look at the number of deals, the U.S. had 962 deals since 2010 through Q2-15, which is significantly higher than China or India's 188 and 184 deals. So just looking at some broader trends, um, Asia has seen the most funding, as we talked about, and this has been a lot. A lot of that has been driven by some of the mega rounds. Specifically, in 2014, there were multiple $500 million plus rounds, including a billion dollar round to Flipkart, a $700 million round to Flipkart, and then Snapdeal's $627 million round. North America has seen a similar uptick, with Q2 15 reaching over a billion dollars due to large rounds to Context Logic, which owns Wish. Blue Apron, and Warby Parker. Europe funding hasn't been as consistent, um, but as you saw in Q, as you can see in Q115, when funding reached $1.2 billion, there has been some activity, but most of the uh, drivers of this funding has been within the food and grocery space, uh, with companies such as Delivery Hero, HelloFresh, and Food Panda all raising very large rounds. So who are the unicorns in this space? Uh, unicorns are company valued at a billion dollars or more. Um, these are th this is the overall breakout. As of the end of Q2 15, there were 22 physical goods e-commerce unicorns. Asia led all the continents with nine, with North America trailing at eight and Europe at five. Uh, as you can see, they're across multiple verticals, whether it's Blue Apron and Instacart in the food space, um, multi-product commerce on Flipkart, you know, daily deals, or uh, other goods, you know, such as more verticalized spaces like Warby Parker and House. Um, this chart also does not include the Honest Company, which, mo which most recently raised over a billion dollar valuation. And here we just get an overview of unicorns by country, with U.S., China, and India accounting for 68% of all unicorns. So who are the most active investors? Where are the other investors coming from? Uh, we're going to dive into that. So any attractive market means the smart money is increasingly active. So the smart money we classify as you know, some of the top VC funds in the world. This includes funds like Greylock, Bessemer, uh, Battery Ventures, First Round Capital, etc. Um, Excel Partners has been the most active. And as you can see here using our social graph, uh, they have a lot of activity and also a few common invested investments. So Excel has invested in Flipkart, Mintra, Bonobos, Bobblecar and also invested in Etsy, with re which recently went public with USV and Index Ventures. Kleiner Perkins, who has the second most exits of any investor since 2010, invested in Jingdong, which went public, as well as Unicorn Instacart, and also other high-growth companies like Dollar Shave Club, which recently passed Schick for number two in market share overall in uh, razor blades. And corporates have also been pretty active. So, over 20 deals per quarter for nine straight quarters, and the rounds that they've participated in have been topping one billion for the last six quarters. And a lot of the Asian mega rounds have featured uh, featured the corporates. So Ellie.me, which is a food delivery company, they raised 350 million dollars, and that featured Tencent, Jingdong, and Jianping. And uh, if you look back in Q2 11, that spike you're seeing is a 1.5 billion dollar round, which featured Walmart. As we kind of just talked about, um, China leads all countries within e-commerce uh, from corporate investment. And you can see those large rounds, which we mentioned, Jingdong, Jianping, LA.me, accounted for over $3 billion in funding alone since 2010. And that is almost up to the uh, total that the United States has seen since 2010. Here's a few activity. Corporates are Corporates are getting active across multiple verticals. So you're seeing Intel Capital investing in Snapdeal, you know, Google Ventures and vertical uh, mobile apparel marketplace Spring, Tencent across multiple Asian companies doing food delivery, uh, and then Comcast even with their venture arm doing Instacart and Dollar Shave Club. So it's, it's across you know food delivery, apparel, home furnishings, broad marketplaces, um, and vertical marketplaces. Um, there are also large entrenched players that are investing in e-commerce. So here are a few of them, and we're just going to run through uh, what they've been doing. Um, so to start, you know, as of recent, Amazon has made 
really one main investment uh, on the pure physical goods e-commerce side, and that was Yummy77, which is a Chinese online food vendor that they took part in the corporate minority round for $20 million in May. But they've also made a few investments on the uh, e-commerce tech side, which isn't exactly in line with what we're talking about today, but thought it was notable to mention. Um, so whether that's fleet tracking and telematics or you know, shoe fitter, which is an online shoe fitting tool, or the Yodel Delivery Network, which is a parcel delivery company in the UK. Um, all of them have clearly paying attention to e-commerce and clearly, clearly making sure that they're staying ahead of any trends that they see. Uh, next, we want to go to JD. Uh, JD's multi-product commerce. Uh, they've invested in you know, multiple Asian retailers, three of which are focused on the food space, um, LA Dami, Fruit Day, and Daojia. But then also uh, My My Bao Information Technology, which is an SMS-based mobile retailer. And that's something that they've invested in as emerging markets uh, continue to come online in some of the you know, less digitally penetrated and less uh, in lower internet penetration markets. SMS e-commerce is something that uh, many have seen as kind of a way to bridge the gap until um, markets get online and start building some of that you know, quote unquote digital uh, buying behavior with, with uh, consumers. eBay has also had multiple investments and acquisitions uh, over the past few years. So Geosys, which is a joint venture, it's a multi-product online marketplace uh, targeting Asia. Snap Deals, also Daily Deals. Um, Rumger, which is location-based secondhand goods they acquired. And Quicker, which is an online uh, classified site. And Alibaba, same thing, um, mostly in Asia-based companies. And then you have food delivery, online flash sales, daily deals, um, and then also recently in February, investing in Jet.com, which is you know trying to take on Amazon using more efficient uh, delivery methods. There's also been packs of hedge funds and mutual funds that are moving in at the late stage, and even in some cases, the early stage, like Tiger Global, who invested in Eve's Sleep Seed Round, or Dragoneer, which invested in T-Box's $6 million Series A. So this is a trend that we're seeing uh, drastically increase in 2014, but we're kind of seeing this across all of tech more broadly. Um, hedge funds and mutual funds are moving down the funding stack, as they say, and getting into mid and late stage deals. And it's kind of being driven by that private IPO trend that everyone's talking about. Companies having the availability to raise money and then subsequently wanting to stay private longer to either avoid the scrutiny of the public markets and, and or build, uh, build their business in a maybe way that public markets would not be as palatable for. So some of the top crossover investors in physical goods e-commerce, uh, just looking here, Tiger Global, Goldman Sachs, T. Rowe Price, Fidelity. Um, their investments kind of are across the board in, in, uh, in company type and vertical type, but they are all have been very active. And when we look at the most active traditional VC investors, you see a lot of the uh, usual suspects and, you know, SV Angel and 500 startups, and also companies like Box Group, which have definitely an e-commerce uh, hint to them with David Tisch um, being you know, this is essentially being his fund with Adam Rothenberg, and they also started Spring, which is a vertical mobile commerce company as well. So clearly they're, they're paying attention to this space, as well as Andreessen Horowitz, First Round Capital, Index Vendors, Founder Collective, Great Oaks VC, and uh, Holtz Brink, which is invested in multiple European startups in the e-commerce space. So who are the startup challengers? Who are the companies with emerging uh, with momentum? Uh, we use a tool called Company Mosaic, and basically the mantra is that a liquid doesn't have to mean opaque. And so what Mosaic does is quantitatively analyze uh, private companies, and it tracks three M's. Um, so momentum, which uses signals from hiring growth, executive turnover, you know, news sentiment, uh, job listings, web traffic, mobile app data, and social media chatter, and a few other things um, to create a score on how, how much momentum a given company has at, at a time. We also analyze the company's market, so what they what they operate in. You know, if you're operating in a space like uh, you know car hailing, that's a very hot space. Your score could be improved because of that. And then also money, the financial strength of your company and the viability of the company based on their burn rate, their financial their financing history, and investor quality. So if you're a seed stage company and you haven't raised in 24 months, um, your money score is going to be affected because of that. Because there's a high likelihood that you are going to need to raise money soon. With this, companies are scored on a 0 to 1,000 scale. And this is how it looks on our platform in practice. You can see the Honest Company here, um, one of the highest rated multi-product e-commerce companies on our platform. 
obviously, like I said, this was before uh, this was taken, you know, as they were getting ready to announce that, that big round of financing. And we're just going to kind of gloss over this. Um, as, as you know, you're going to get this presentation afterwards if you want, so you can see some of these companies. But we looked at some of the top four companies across marketplaces, across brands, and then also across the on-demand space. Um, also, Mosaic is good at identifying, you know, somewhat potentially problemed companies. So what we've seen, these are three that we looked at, uh, that we've done some research in and had, had data kind of indicate that these companies might be worth keeping an eye on for hiring or M&A purposes. Um, so Lot18, you know, is, has had, is an online high-end marketplace, wine marketplace, and they've downsized and shut down UK operations. Um, Glossybox also shut down multiple offices. And Spoon Rocket, we uh, dove deeper in in, in, a, in a blog post, but their rivals have raised a lot of money, and they recently had to shut down in Seattle after only four months after their launch. So these are just companies to keep an eye on. Uh, moving towards our case study, um, we're looking at Nordstrom, uh, who has been you know, one of the kind of thought leaders in this retail to uh, e-commerce and kind of creating that omni-channel experience. Um, as of now, uh, web accounts for 19% of of Nordstrom sales, which is up from 16.4% in 2013, um, and equivalent of about $2.5 billion. So a little background on Nordstrom. Um, in 1998, they launched Nordstrom.com, and then in May 2008 slash into 2009, they uh, introduced the buy online, pick up in store concept, and they were one of the first big you know, national retailers to do this. And this is kind of the the quote that Jamie Nordstrom, who's the president of stores now of Nordstrom, said is, we can sell more without having to buy more inventory, and that plays through to margins and ultimately earnings. So they saw it as a great opportunity to, um, you know, bridge the gap between online and offline, which is something that any major retailer is now working to do. Um, in February 2011, Nordstrom made kind of one of its first splashy acquisitions within the e-commerce space, uh, acquiring Hotlook. And so another quote from uh, you know, Blake Nordstrom was, well, well, our focus on prov providing a superior in-store shopping experience is our roots. Continuing to find ways to use technology to serve customers the way they want to be served is critical. Um, and this was at a time where flash sales were very hot. Uh, Rue La La had just been acquired about a year prior, I believe, from GSI, by GSI Commerce. And you know, Nordstrom has always been on the cutting edge of understanding what customers want and that customer experience uh, thought process and this was you know a splashy acquisition at the time and I think it kind of showed their you know beginning dedication to really e-commerce and you know skating to where the puck was going not where it is. Um, a few of their partnerships which we'll look at in more detail in the next slide just over time uh, you know you have Bonobos, um, Etsy, Winello, Bobble Bar, Madewell and most recently Warby Parker and so a lot of these partnerships have been with the idea of bridging online brands' um, presence into offline. And that's something that any of these brands want to do eventually if they can achieve that scale and achieve uh, that success online first. So Bonobos is one of the first companies which Nordstrom is an investor in. And uh, you know they were the first major retailer to stock Bonobos clothing for sale. Um, Etsy did a pilot as well to have Etsy wholesale things in Nordstrom's at-home stores. Um, Winello did a kind of trending products wall display. Bobble Bar is selling their jewelry in Nordstrom. Um, you know, Madewell, which is a part of the J. Crew brand, has agreed to be you know sold in Nordstrom. And Warby Parker most recently announced that it's uh, its first national department store to sell select frames and some exclusive frames as like a pop-in test. And I think why a lot of these startups are willing to partner with them is kind of going back to what we were saying before. Nordstrom's dedication to customer experience, and these companies are, you know, building their brands and uh, so dedicated to the idea of customer experience, which you have to be when you're online-only commerce. And I think if you're going to go offline and really trust another company, another entity to control that brand experience and user experience, at least in some way, uh, Nordstrom is the you know leader in in that in that uh, expertise. On the investment side, um, these are a few of their recent investments as well. So. And, and acquisition. So the Hotlook acquisitions we talked about, um, Bonobos, which they invested in, you know, their their Series C in 2013, but um, you know, also invested in Bonobos in April 2012. Trunk Club, which they acquired in in 2014 for 350 million, 
And Trunk Load offers a curated selection of casual clothing for men, uh, mostly uh, via you know delivery. It was kind of getting into that subscription commerce trend and trying to understand how uh, more consumers were looking for curation and not having to uh, go out and do the shopping themselves. And then Soul Society, which is another lifestyle brand, which they uh, invested in their Series A in 2012, but mo re most recently an $8 million Series C round in July. And so Nordstrom's acquisitions and investments and, you know, paying attention seems to have paid off. Um, you know, they've, they've been, everyone has talked about how great they've been uh, within the e-commerce, how their strength has really helped on building the technology. And, uh, you know, we have a tweet here in the bottom right from Greg Bettinelli who says, you know, four plus years after the Nordstrom acquisition, Hallux sales are still growing over 50%. Um, and it just shows that, you know, they're, they're building, they're acquiring businesses, they're investing businesses, and they're continuing to grow them, which will probably help them as they continue to think about M&A uh, within the space. Um, you know, with that, we're going to talk about the faster pace of disruption and, you know, why incumbent players need to move quickly. And so it's harder than ever now to stay on top. You know, you can see the lifespan of the S&P 500 becoming shorter and shorter. And uh, if you don't pay attention to, you know, the emerging business models and the problems of tomorrow, the pace of disruption is incredibly quick. This is based off the Clay Christensen uh, disruptive innovation framework. And so we've seen already incumbents validating new e-commerce models. So in the on-demand space, uh, you know, we've seen Grubhub validating the idea of, you know, foregoing the sit-down restaurant having just the prepared food aspect of the business, um, you know, related to Munchery and Sprig and seeing that opportunity. And, uh, you know, the CEO of Grubhub has said that it's definitely something he expects the segment to grow, you know, exponentially in the near future. And, you know, they're they're clearly paying attention to other growth areas. And there's plenty of room for opportunity across physical goods e-commerce, um, even in the U.S., which, you know, a lot of what we're going to be talking about in the, in the rest of the presentation is going to be, you know, very emerging market and Asia focused. But in the U.S., you can see um, that this is from a Rocket Internet presentation, you know, consumer goods, still has relatively low online penetration, online travel and fashion and home and living, and then, as we know, food and groceries. And so we've seen vertical marketplaces kind of spring up across all of these, um, all, all these different areas, and we're seeing that now both in the U.S. and internationally. And on the food and grocery space, uh, you know, there are definitely lots of startups trying to capitalize on these opportunities. So this is kind of a look at the increasingly crowded food delivery market, and this is just more focus on you know prepared food stuff and uh, and the, the the boxes of ingredients to cook and we're seeing you know just in the past year uh, over eight different companies funded and we're hearing more and more every day. Um, some of the emerging business models we're seeing within physical goods e-commerce uh, direct to consumer. So the concept that was kind of pioneered by Warby Parker originally, um, along with some others, was cutting at the middleman and being able to sell a product of equal quality that consumers are used to for a cheaper price. So, you know, Warby Parker came on and everyone was kind of blown away by their take on taking on Luxottica, which was the titan of glasses. Um, and we've seen many different companies in different verticals spring up. So Casper and Lisa in the, uh, in the mattress direct consumer space, and then Harry's and the Razors, who are some of the founders of Harry's are old co-founders of Warby Parker. And even, you know, more earlier stage companies like Brilliant, which is doing bicycles. Um, next, you know, we've seen subscription commerce, which is something that is probably one of the older trends, but it still has has some interest that we've seen, uh, you know, happen more on the, on the food side as of recent. But Dollar Shave Club won, uh, Birch Box, Nature Box on the snacks, Bark Box on the dog, and Blue Apron, which you can do on a, on a subscription basis uh, with kind of helping replenish your uh, kitchen. We've also seen the on-demand market, which everyone knows about. Um, everyone's talked about billions of dollars of funding. Uh, consumers are more than ever using their phone as a remote control to the rest of their lives. And uh, the idea of getting food, getting alcohol, getting anything you need delivered, whether that's, you know, including even marijuana, we've seen companies be funded for. So this is something that we don't think is going to slow. And we think that, uh, you know, overall, as, as mobile penetration increases and as this kind of thought process of the on-demand consumer continues to grow, um, this is something that is a multi-year trend that's been developing. And last, secondhand products, um, just kind of taking that idea of, of, you know, thrift stores or used marketplaces online, maybe doing a better Craigslist in, in certain verticals. 
Um, that's something we've seen, you know, even today, ThreadUp announced $81 million funding at a $500 million valuation from Goldman Sachs. We've also seen a lot in the used car marketplace. So two Asian companies, Uixin Pai and Chei Pai, uh, both have raised over $100 million rounds. And we've seen used car marketplaces uh, have over $1.1 billion in funding since 2014. So clearly the different verticals, um, whether it's apparel or cars, uh, it's it's getting funding and it's getting noticed by investors. And these consumer facing brands, you know, they need to pay attention more than ever. So you look at the idea of online only brands, which we've talked about and, you know, controlling in, in you know, extreme detail the uh, consumer experience and the brand messaging and companies like Procter & Gamble, which have, you know, billions of dollars of products are being unbundled everywhere from Walker & Company to Glossier to, you know, Beam, to Unreal Foods, to Honest Company, uh, they have to pay attention. And these are, you know, these Honest Company and Harry's and Dollar Shave Club, you know, these are big companies that are uh, well-funded and have plenty of, have plenty of uh, resources to try and take them on in their given verticals. And then perhaps Trojan horse their way into other areas. And we're also seeing this in a smaller extent on the fashion side. Um, companies like Everlane and Bonobos and Jack Irwin, you know, taking on, any of the large fashion brands and trying to provide better branding, you know, more transparency about their materials, more transparency about, you know, the origin of their product, things like that, and, uh, you know, doing it across pretty much the entire stack of clothing, whether that's, you know, menswear, women's wear, accessories, et cetera. And the funding to the space is falling too. You know, we've already seen 2015 reaching a new high, over $230 million, and, you know, this, this is, as of August, and so we're we're seeing the the investors follow this trend, and uh, this is something that we're going to keep an eye on in the future. And what's what's old is new again. Um, startups going are even going brick and mortar, and so many of these different startups that we've been talking about have either opened pop up or full scale brick and mortar shops, and uh, that includes Birchbox with their store in Soho. Everlane has done a pop up shop. Warby Parker is obviously has a huge brick and mortar strategy. Uh, Frank and Oak, Harry's, Bonobos, and Bobble Bar, and uh, you know these these companies are using the brick and mortar as partially a marketing play in some instances, but also in in a way to kind of get get the uh, people who are offline shoppers aware of their brands and aware of you know what they're doing, their business models, and it's a way to reach new customers in new areas and also really maintain a presence in people's lives. But uh, many companies avoid retail shops because of the overhead costs. But Warby Parker's eight stores have actually turned a profit, and they sell an average of $3,000 a square foot each year. And that figure is actually higher than Tiffany and uh, over twice as much as Best Buy. So clearly, even though some startups may shy away from brick and mortar as a brand extension, um, Warby Parker has done a great job in kind of being able to have the brand extension really live in a physical space. And a few of the other trends we, we're seeing, um, you know, E-commerce shipments, including free shipping, and then the next frontier of that is free shipping on returns. One-day sales uh, becoming huge. So on Singles Day in Asia, Alibaba sold billions of dollars. You know, Cyber Monday sales reached $2.3 billion. And then also mobile commerce. So especially in Asia, um, where you know it's just a lot of these economies are becoming and starting mobile first when they hit the internet. Uh, mobile e-commerce is you know 42% sales share in India and around 33% in China. And even it goes as far as uh, Flipkart, who has now decided to essentially create an app-only shopping experience. So bringing most of the across some other verticals, so bringing most of the internet shopping experience mobile and making sure that it's optimized for the best user experience and not having to like, bridge a gap between a mobile optimized website. So what's next? Um, as we look at the U.S. e-commerce penetration. Uh, it's now accounts for over 6% of all retail sales on a quarterly basis, and this is obviously something that's only going to continue to grow. We look at it on a global basis. Um, we've seen growth of 60% from 2012 to 2015. Uh, 2015 is expected to be around $1.7 trillion uh, and surpassing $2 trillion globally in 2017. Um, and, you know, overall retail is expected to reach $28.3 trillion or so in 2008, so by 2008, we're going to see around an 8% penetration for e-commerce. Um, looking at buyer penetration, so understanding what economies are becoming, you know, digital buyers and shopping online, 
Asia is obviously the highest growth opportunity here. Um, China and India are driving the bulk of that growth, and they're going to make up, you know, more than half of the uh, the all of Asia's e-commerce sales this year. And I think what we're seeing now more is, you know, North America is growing, Asia is growing, um, but Asia we're we're going to see, you know some of the more emerging markets start to come on in Southeast Asia, uh, which will drive continued growth from, you know, the 42.1% in 2013 to over 50% uh, starting in 2017. And we look at e-commerce sales share by region, this kind of just mirrors how we see penetration going. Um, you know, U.S. e-commerce sales shares are going to continue to decrease as Asia, which has a significantly larger population, uh, continues to get online and increase. And Starting, you know, in as early as 2015, uh, by the end of this year, Asia e-commerce sales will surpass uh, North America overall. Um, and when we go into exits, which is kind of driving some of this, is, uh, you know, the, the VC-backed exit history. We've seen a lot of big exits in the past year or two. 2014 was, you know, a great year for physical goods e-commerce with seven IPOs, um, you know, Alibaba and... Uh, Jingdong and you know Zalando, we've all seen exits in in big ways, but uh, public markets haven't been kind to some of these IPOs. So obviously here we see Etsy, they grew revenue um, and they narrowed their earnings, but the stock still got killed. And Etsy, in that same time, they tumbled below their IPO price. Um, Alibaba, with some macroeconomic things happening in China and then also just their sales slowing, they missed earnings and and they've their stock has been hurt. And JD as well. Um, also, has you know had nosedives over, over the past you know two quarters as their earnings have been uh, you know not as good as the market had hoped. But could this poor public market performance lead to consolidation? Um, you know the most recent example is Zulily, who stumbled out of the gate and never really did that well um, after a brief pop in I think in mid to early 2014. The stock just kind of cratered and just recently QVC. Uh, owner Liberty bought Zulily in $2.3 billion deal, so a small premium to the stock market price. But we could see other large retailers potentially picking up, you know, beaten up stocks for the uh, e-commerce, you know, to, to build out like a multi-product e-commerce suite. And we've also seen, you know, older legacy companies like Karma Loop, which is a much smaller deal, um, being sold to lenders because they just didn't change with the times and no suitors emerged to kind of even buy the assets of, of a company that at one time was doing uh, over $100 million in revenue. And we're also seeing some strategic M&A. Um, you know, a perfect example of this is what Rocket Internet has done in Europe. So they've created two groups. Uh, they, the, this is the Global Online Takeaway Group, which their general thesis is around, um, is around you know, food delivery and the idea of this, this concept of food delivery proliferating through all sorts of emerging markets and taking stakes in the companies within each market instead of trying to move their existing entities into those markets. So with this, they've been able to create a network of very strong, um, very strong e-commerce companies related to food and understanding that you know, digital penetration for that is very low, but the market is huge, and doing it in a way that is uh, not, not trying to get into you know, the US and trying to deal with the Grubhub and seamlesses of the world, but more focused on areas where they feel like they can have a competitive edge and use their uh, you know, great ability to scale businesses very quickly to their advantage. So what's going to drive this growth in the rest of the world? Uh, we've seen a lot of the, these mega rounds come through, um, and you know, this, this has been $100 million plus financings in Asia have really, you know, exploded. And this is because a lot of investors are looking at the growth story in Asia overall. So you have growing internet penetration growth, you have the changing purchasing behavior, which we've seen. So, you know, the idea of consumers getting on onto digital platforms and understanding how, how to uh, continue to shop in, in different ways and on different, on different verticalized ways. Uh, and then also, you know, the growing middle class um, within each of these regions. So, you know, India is one of the youngest nations, also has one of the fastest growing middle classes, and will be, I believe, one of the youngest uh, developed nations by 2018. Uh, and so what we've really seen in these markets and with these mega rounds is that different trends are emerging. So in Asia, we're seeing multi-product -co commerce, which is kind of these Amazon-type companies, uh, like a Flipkart or a Jingdong or, you know, a Lazada, and then as well as discount retailers on, and daily deals like Kupang or Jianping. In the U.S., actually, four, three of the four uh, large $100 million-plus rounds 
were uh, to home furnishing companies, interestingly enough, and, and kind of that home home appar home uh, accessory companies. So like One Kings Lane, which raised $112 million, Wayfair, which is now public, which raised $157 million, and House, which raised $165 million. Uh, the fourth being the food and grocery space, which was Instacart, which raised $220 million. And Europe, which we've talked about, which has really been dominated by that rocket internet uh, you know, group was mostly food and grocery as well, Delivery Hero and Food Panda and HelloFresh. And, you know, the growth story that people are being pitched isn't just a story. It's definitely there. Um, Alibaba, if you look at this chart, you know, you see Alibaba, they scale their gross merchandise value, which isn't sales, but it's the amount that they're selling on the platform um, to Amazon's level in just six years. And the growth has been explosive ever since 2011 reaching over $350 billion uh, in this past year. And JD, which is in, on an even shorter timeline, is approaching $50 billion in just four years. So if you look at the, the time it took Amazon to get there and the time it took eBay to get there, uh, the amount of people that are transacting on these platforms and the way in which they're transacting is huge. And I think one of the things that people are going to start looking at more is not only just the absolute buyers, but also the average order values. So one of the things that you see in more developed nations like Australia, Japan, US, UK, and other parts of Western Europe is that not only is buyer penetration high, but average order value is high. Where in less mature markets you're seeing, you know, like India and Indonesia and things like that, there are large absolute numbers of buyers, but many are new to the market. So because of that, they're not buying the high ticket items, they're new digital buyers, they're really trying to just wet their feet with some of these less costly purchases. And uh, whether that's because of income constraints sometimes or product availability online, it's something that uh, is, is definitely something that many analysts and other people like us are watching. And this is kind of what we've been talking about with internet user penetration. So you see this, this almost break away at 20%. Um, and that's where people are, are always talking about how India is a few years behind what China is doing. And everyone's seen the growth that China has seen. Um, so India, people are wondering if these next three or four years is their uh, is this their like breakout time? And we've seen a lot of funding in that in that space happen. We've seen uh, U.S. investors really start crossing over and doing more deals there. Most specifically, Tiger Global, who has gone from being a hedge fund and doing later stage deals in the U.S. to being one of the most active investors in Asia and specifically pouring tons of money and doing entire rounds themselves in India. And I guess the last question is, is all of this growth sustainable? So when we're looking at some of these high growth services, uh, the take rates are incredibly low. So the rate at which the, the fees essentially they're charging, the commissions they're charging for the transactions they're doing on the platform. So you look at eBay, their global marketplace is around 8%. Um, then you look at Taobao, you know, even though their gross, gross merchandise value volume is huge, uh, their take rate's very low. And many wonder if that low take rate is what's driving a lot of this growth because it means a more attractive platform for consumers. And you see the same kind of thing with Groupon versus Meituan. Um, similar explosive growth, but huge discrepancy in take rates. And so all this is kind of looking at that, that final point of, you know, it's not the first time in tech that companies have sacrificed economics for growth, but as we continue to look at the e-commerce space and as we continue to think about, you know, how is Asia going to change? How is the, this you know, globalization of e-commerce going to change and really play out to where uh, Asian companies are transacting often in the U.S. and U.S. companies are trying to break into Asia for the large market and moving even into South America and Europe and in some instances as well Africa. This is something that I think a lot of people are going to have to pay attention to, and uh, this is kind of where we're going to where we're going to end this part of the presentation. So with that, um, we're going to move to some of the questions and you know underlying how you get underlying data and helpful links. So to start, um, if you have questions for us and you want to access the underlying data, uh, you can talk to our customer success team, which is uh, Jonathan McKenna, who's the head of our customer success, as well as Anand Sanwal, who's our CEO. Um, and if you're not a customer, you can reach out to Anand or you can set up a free trial account to see some of the data. Um, and so yeah, as, as you go through, you can look through and see some of the profiles that we've done some of these companies. Um, with that, we're going to start taking a few questions. So let me just look through what questions we have here. Um, is the food delivery market overcrowded? Uh, you know, we, we had that slide. I think that's something that people are talking about more and more, uh, specifically in the U.S. Um, 
I think it, it is getting a little overcrowded and frothy. There are definitely, the economics make sense, at least in, the, in terms of the size of the market and the being, being able to build a venture scale business. Um, whether the actual economics of the businesses make sense is a different story. Uh, in prepared meal delivery, you know, we're seeing Sprig and Munchery run away a little bit and DoorDash and Postmates in terms of, you know, some of the food delivery stuff. But we're also seeing, you know, emerging business models and companies like Peach and Arcade who are doing sort of these SMS based, uh, you know, they're, they're pushing something to you and having you make a decision. And I think that those kind of differentiations are what make it less overcrowded and we'll, uh, we'll have to see how, how people continue to differentiate. I don't think that overall you can compete having the exact same strategy as some of the most well-funded people because they're going to be able to outspend on marketing and things like that. Um, what else do we have? Uh, well, what is Walmart doing in the e-commerce space? Um, so Walmart has been somewhat active in e-commerce, but they they most recently acquired a company in China that does uh, multi-product commerce called Yi Haojian in July of 2015. And I think what Walmart saw, and, and they, they were had previously held a stake in this company, what they saw um, as they tried to break into China was that they, they didn't really understand the local culture as well as they thought in the buying patterns. And, this was kind of their investment. They, they had said they hope that it helps the company really start to understand that. Uh, they've also invested in a few companies and, or acquired a few companies through Walmart Labs, uh, like Loveocracy, which does kind of a Pinterest-like social marketplace for goods, and then uh, a company called Styler, which isn't as much physical goods e-commerce, but tries to bridge the gap of digital and physical, so allows in-store shopping assist via mobile phones and that's kind of that's speaking towards the trend of this omni-commerce channels um, and it be, being able to blend both online and offline and get rid of you know the the different experience by shopping in store versus uh, on the internet. Um, what trends are you seeing in Southeast Asia related to e-commerce? Uh, you know, we, Southeast Asia has some has some large players in it uh, in multi-product commerce like Lazada. Um, you know, in other more emerging areas, where you know we've seen like Vietnam, they're they're getting online more. Their internet, internet penetration is growing at a pretty high rate. Uh, but from what we've read, uh, they're not used to buying without seeing and touching goods, which is very different from uh, economies like India. And because of that, you know, e-commerce sales are expected to. Uh, to almost double year over year from 2014 to 2015. So that's definitely something that uh, you know we're we're looking at. Um, we'll got we time for one more question. Uh, do you think what Rocket Internet has done is good for Europe's startup scene? Um, I think on the on the e-commerce side, it's they've I don't know if it's good or bad, um, but what they're doing is they're using you know their their skills of fundraising and scaling businesses very well across, you know, both fashion and apparel marketplaces as well as food delivery marketplaces. And so, you know, that that idea of uh, going into new markets and having entrepreneurs perhaps maybe sell the, a big stake of their company that they've started to work with the Rocket Internet, um, you know, big holding company is something that maybe that'll create windfalls in those economies um, and then lead to, you know, better proliferation of angel investors. Uh, but it's it's hard to say. Um, overall, what this the, what they're doing though is you know very impressive and uh, has been has been pretty incredible. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. Uh, we definitely have some questions that we uh, couldn't get answered. But um, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. You can uh, email me at mdempsey at cbinsights.com or the people I'd mentioned. Um, and you can 